so honored to be here with you. Thank you, Glenn, and the organizing committee, and the, uh, the ISB for asking me to do this uh, keynote. So everybody looks bright and she tailed um, So thank you very much for giving me the opportunity for me to be here. Um, I'm one of those folks who's actually not a member. I'm testing up right up front, but I'm really interested. It's been, the mingling so far has been interesting, and I'm, I'm curious to see um, how many of you, so I'm going to be talking about One Health, and so I'd like to know, just to show of hands, how many of you think of yourselves or are on the public health, human health side of this? How many of you are on the environmental ecological side? How many of you do animal health? How many of you do all three? Okay. All right, I'm just asking. Okay, well, um, so I'm Julie Tartan. I'm from the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And my job at NOAA is to coordinate the health activities um, across our agency with public health partners, both international, um, federal, state, and, and local, though we generally work with our um, Centers for Disease Control on that state and local connection. My other hat is a really long part of my title is Integrated Climate and Weather Extremes Research Lead. Um, so I'm actually in the Climate Program Office of, of NOAA in the United States, and um, we are the research arm of a lot of the climate research, um, including the integrated research I'm going to talk about, some of which I'll talk about today. So, Where are we going today? I thought I'd start with just a little roadmap for you, and um, we already heard from somebody like Carl Sagan. You'll see a few Einstein quotes in mine because I'm an Einstein fan. So, um, so you'll see this little thing says a miracle occurs right here. I, I figure that's most of you in this room. Somehow we start with questions, and science illuminates with the candle, and somehow a miracle occurs, and we get answers out of this. So we're going to talk a little bit about. Uh, what problems we're trying to solve in the context of One Health, what One Health actually means, um, how is it helping put knowledge into practice, who has what role, both institutions and people, and what do we go, how do we, how do we go forward from here? So, what problem are we trying to solve? There's a long list here. None of these are unfamiliar to you. When is the next disease outbreak going to come from and, and why are we still surprised? How many heat waves are we going to have this year and when? What's wildfire, what's in the wildfire smoke beyond just the particulate matter? And why are we having more of them? I think some of us know the answers to these questions, but not all of the answers. Why is that whale sick? And can I still go to the beach? Should I be worried? What does that mean for my health? Why is the drinking water green? Did you, did you hear about that? Green drinking water in Toledo, Ohio? Why does that happen? What's going on there? Is the seafood safe to eat? Am I sure I'm not going to get sick? Is it safe to pet the gorilla? Seriously, is it safe to pet the gorilla? We can actually give our diseases to animals, especially endangered animals. It's not just a one-way street about our health. It's how do we affect them as well. What's going to happen to the peoples of the Arctic, native populations around the world? You could say the same about small islands, those in, at very much on the edge of their environmental and ecosystem um, sustainability. When will that drought end? And what is that new disease? What's the new bug that came with that? These are things that you see in the news that many of you deal with already in some way, shape, or form. They are basically <coughs> at the intersection of environment, ecosystem health, animal health, and human health. So it would be remiss of me to start a talk like this without talking about some of the infectious disease outbreaks around the world. These slides, there are several of them. And the point is that there are a lot of infectious diseases, and every year we're surprised by something new somewhere or a reoccurrence of something. And yet we observe this. We know that something's going to come. We observe the Earth systems. We have some models that predict from transmission dynamics, but yet we don't have a system that says, ooh, there's a greater risk of these diseases year, or this part of the world is at greater risk than normal because of these conditions, and here's what to do about it. We already have seen, as, as Glenn pointed out, also, I mean, almost every week, but certainly on a regular basis, more floods, more extreme events, and so many human, animal, and ecological systems are already at their limits, or repeated, repeated stress of you know, long-term drought on top of a heat wave, or heat wave on top of a drought, 
or floods on top of drought. Rain finally comes, but the, but the land can't accept it. And then what does that mean for the humans that live there and the animals that live there? We already see, um, I didn't want to blow up that picture on the left too much because it's, it's sad but true. I mean, the drought and the heat affect animals and we don't have any, any place for them to go or you have so many, you're raising them as food for food production. They're in great peril and a lot of them die. Um, what does that mean on their way out? What does that mean for the availability and quality of our food and the quality of their life? Obviously, there is no quality of life left. Um, and even the ones that are trying to eke out a living, whether it's a, it's a duck or whether it's you know us trying to grow corn or food for our own feet or for our own people. Drought has impacts that are both ecological and indirect on our health as well as the direct effects on our health. I wanted to put this up too because I think we often think about this um, interplay of ecosystems in a little abject removed way, but there are mental health disorders that are associated with this as well. With the repeated um, impact of disasters, you have people who are, are stressed on this PTSD from, from re relocation and repeated stress of being the, in the eye of a disaster. You have relocation issues and cultural identity loss. That top picture up there is graves that are being washed in the sea. The middle picture is Alaskan village that's having to be relocated. It is literally falling into the sea now that the ice is melting and the conditions are changing so rapidly in the Arctic. And then um, a Red Cross picture, I believe this is Katrina. And the last piece, since I know from NOAA, um, we do not just the climate work, we do we have the weather service and the ocean service, we also have the fishery service, and we do a lot of marine mammal work. And one of the questions we have in a One Health context at NOAA is, what are the marine animals telling us about our environment and our human risk? The middle um, picture there is a sea lion undergoing an MRI in a hospital that shall remain nameless because it was kind of midnight and it was you know, when nobody else was around, they really aren't the job of MRI animals. But this was to try and figure out what was causing the epileptic seizures in the sea lion, and it had to do with demonic acid. So um, that animal is living in the environment in which we swim and in which our food is grown. What does that tell us about our environment, and what does that mean for that animal's quality of life? So. That's a little bit of a kind of, when we're talking about One Health, the kinds of things we're talking about, but it's a change in how you think about the problem and how you think about what health means. So health, um, as defined by this particular review and sort of a consensus of findings, state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Even if we got to the absence of disease or infirmity, it would be a step in the right direction. So what is One Health then? It's the intersection of ecosystems, animals, and human health. The collaborative effort of multiple disciplines working locally, globally, and nationally to attain optimal health for animals, people, and the environment. This isn't rocket science, it's intuitive to most of you. What One Health does is offers an approach and a framework and institutionalizes the way we think about these kinds of problems. You know, you think about the context in which we're working, the physical boundaries between humans and our animals are changing, whether it's domestic pets, whether it's our engagement in our ecosystems and our environments, we're out in touch with them more, we're encroaching on the environments and, and their native habitats. Population growth is an additional pressure. It affects the availability and the safety of the food supply um, as well for both us and for the animals that we either rely on as our food or that we take care of. And the way people are interacting with the animals and the environment is changing, hopefully for the better. As more people begin to value their experience outdoors, they're spending more time outdoors. That's a good thing, but sometimes it comes at a greater risk. And as people begin to interact with the animals and care about the animals' quality of life, you know, farm production, that becomes a bigger issue. And what is the quality of the food and the quality of the animal's life? So those issues are, are kind of, um, evolving as we as a science community are evolving, and I think it's incumbent upon us to think about how our science serves society in the way that society is beginning to ask of us. And I think we're doing this individually, and some of you are doing it in teams, but as a society, um, I'm not sure we're quite there yet. So there's been a lot of talk and a lot of effort going into it. It's, we're, on, we're on a good path. So One Health involves a, an approach 
coordinating collaborative multidisciplinary cross-sector to address potential or existing risks. And I highlighted exist existing or potential. This, this is why I think um, I'm so pleased to be talking to you this morning, because in my, in my perspective and from my work, it covers a lot of the work that you're doing and gives a framework for how, how we might interact going forward. So now I'm just going to give a few examples of uh, when wanted to, you know, what, weather and climate in action, right? So I'm going to show a few case studies where we've actually been able to put this into action. So this is an epidemic curve, generalized epidemic curve, and this is kind of how the system works right now. When you have your first case on the bottom, we're looking at case one. Yeah. Case one, uh, there's not a lot of lead time here. It's like, oh, wow, there's a, there's a problem. There's an Ebola outbreak. Gee, how come we didn't know about that? By the time you actually move forward and figure out what you've got and not your response, there's your opportunity for control. If we continue to do the same things the same way we have, we're not going to get very far. This is Einstein. This is my second Einstein quote, the problems we have created in the world today will not be solved by the level of thinking that created them. We have to get out of our own box. So I put some more boxes in. Let's get into a different box. Um, if you look over here, how we use public health engagement, how we use our earth observation systems, how we use our prediction systems, um, sensors and tools, both satellite and in situ, ways of monitoring, our cloud technologies, our social networks, um, those things can do, if we work at them in an integrated fashion, can give us a lot more lead time on how we actually detect and prepare for and actually even prevent some of the outbreaks. Now, how you evaluate that is really challenging because if you don't have an outbreak, how do you know if you were going to anyway? I understand there are lots of problems with that, but we have to begin to figure out how to use our resources to get ahead of the curve and plan a little bit better. I'm not going to go into every piece of this, but my point is that on a data side, we observe the world on a physical and ecological way. And the public health, the, the one thing where I think, one of the things I think that we on the environment and climate side can bring to public health is how we approach data, culture of data collection, how we handle it, how we management. I mean, people's entire careers spend on data management in the climate community, and public health is just, there's a paucity of data. So it's just a, a mental model about approaching data and surveillance systems. Um, but, and, and the reason I say this is that what all these data and observations allow us to do is to understand and predict risk, right? So we always have a, a bit of a fall down when it comes down to what we can say about real human health risk or animal health risk, but we know a little bit more about the environmental system. We know right now, this is, um, this is a slide done by a colleague of mine, J.P. Chrétien, out of the um, Department of Defense, actually. And it's just worth looking at outbreaks um, that are associated with El Nino events, El Nino-associated rainfall and temperature patterns. And you can see that, um, you know, point here. Malaria risk, chick, dengue. Um, these are, the point of this slide is mostly to tell you and to make sure that we're all on the same page that we do understand enough about some of the environmental drivers for some of these infectious diseases to be able to use environmental drivers to predict them. We're not doing that yet in many cases, but it is possible. Um, we know sea surface temperature and vegetation are intimately linked, and you can look at some of the changes here with different sea surface temperature. I chose not to run this video because it takes a while, but you can look at the changes in sea surface temperature along with the changes in vegetation, and know that there's a correlation there that can be used to, to predict the changes in the ecological system that affect disease risk. So when we talk about Rift Valley fever, um, it's a mosquito livestock, um, a mosquito-borne disease affecting livestock and humans, mostly in East Africa, um, Rift Valley, thus the name Rift Valley fever. Um, there have been studies done, and I'm putting the dates down here because this started a little before 1997, and the work to look at effective rainfall um, was started by an interagency program that funded some folks from CDC, actually CDC by MI started that program, and 
the folks from TDC went to do the disease outbreak in 97, 98. Um, they took hobos with them, which were you know weather collection instruments, and they came back with a spreadsheet that said, "Great, here's your here's your spreadsheet, and here's the data, health data, IgM, IgG, all great blood analysis." Spreadsheet here, spreadsheet there. Geolocated, not a clue, nothing. It took us about a year and a half to figure out how to anchor enough points that we can begin to do that correlation. We have come such a long way. <laughs> we have come such a long way. And, and this is just a little slide about the, the cycle here. It's an enzootic, it's a transovarial transmission um, of the Aedes aegypti mosquito. What means is that the mosquitoes and, and the um, infected eggs can lie dormant in the soil for a very long time and until enough moisture comes, they, they, there's no outbreak. And when enough moisture comes, these little dam boats where they live, um, the, it, the mosquitoes come out. They bite other mosquitoes and other animals and that amplifies the transmission cycle um, tremendously. So it's a big problem for humans, but also for animals. So it affects the food supply. There's a very large abortion storm problem in most of the ungulates. So it's um, both a health issue and a trade issue and a future food supply. I mean, those families will lose their their um, their food source and then milk, milk source for their kid if their goat dies. Um, let's get that one. So with the knowledge of the nature of the problem of roof valley fever, understanding Again, that started before 1997, people were working on this, this connection with Rift Valley fever. Um, really trying to put it together began in 97, and in about 2006 or 7, we began to do some risk maps of Rift Valley fever, and now we actually can do a prediction based on El Nino. We only did this once, where we took the El Nino forecast in last year when there was a risk of Rift Valley fever, and we put the El Nino forecast with the monitoring system. They don't want to call it forecast because it's not. And we said, okay, here comes an El Nino. There's a higher risk of Rift Valley fever. Here's how we know it. And here's what you can do about it. There was nothing new in that information. We just compiled it in a way that decision makers could use it a little bit more easily because it was all together for them. Um, that happened once. It hasn't been institutionalized yet. But it is possible, and it seems such a simple thing that we would actually put all the stuff that's together together in one place, but we haven't done that on a regular basis yet. There are examples, however, where we do this on an ongoing basis, and I don't know if you're familiar with FuseNet, the Family Early Warning System. This has been around since about 1985, I believe is when it got started. And it is an operational system that is focused on famine early warning around the world. And now if you go to the website, there are so many pages, it's actually hard to find the essential information. So they've gone the other way. They've got lots of stuff out there. But this is about food and food security. And again, an agency project here that I, I think is important in the context of the, our ability to produce predictive tools that incorporate environmental drivers with a health outcome for either animals or humans. So it's really looking at that intersection. This is a lot, a lot of information on these that will be about droughts and drought response in, um, in Africa and not around other parts of the world. We need to get to a point where we can do a better job of planning and not just responding. Um, I want to give the um, South, South African Development Corporation a topic. I don't know, I forgot what the C stands for. Um, because they've actually taken that information and made a very tailored product that allows them to be a little bit more proactive with the rainfall estimates that they expect coming. So you'll see here the, um, they're talking about an army worm. So they're already beginning to make the connections, not just with the food availability, but the pests that are coming and whether they're going to be at greater risk and, and where the new ones might be coming because they're looking at those things more specifically. So again, the taking the environmental information, looking at both animal, pet, I mean, a plant pests, but human impact on the food supply as well. So I think food security and food safety give us a good model. They've been at it longer, and it's a little bit more of a direct connection with some of the health ones, but it is possible. This is a very relied upon system um, by many countries now uh, for, for managing uh, risk of food security. Are we still really proactive? Probably not as much as we could be, but this is a, a really good um, case study. <coughs> Malaria. A 
Is that a one whole thing? Yes. But it's also just an infectious disease thing. There are lots of early warning systems that have been built. Um, I would say not. There are several early warning systems that have been built. I think some of you in the room have been involved in the development of them and the evaluation of them. They're still um, not as operational as they could be. Uh, and, and we're going to get to the, some of the institutional questions at the end. What's working about all of these systems? What's working that we should replicate? Why are they not working? Why are they not being utilized? Um, when they are, what's the impact of them? Those questions we haven't really done yet. Um, we've done some reviews, a few reviews of the malaria systems. I'm not sure if anybody's done robust on the family or warning systems. Um, so I think one of the things that moving forward is based on what we've got now, what's working, and what do we do to make sure that we enhance that in the future and, and are a little bit more productive in a timelier fashion um, on some of the, on the issues that we expect to be tackling in the future. I'm gonna spend a little time on cholera and vibrios. Vibrios live in the marine environment. Um, the vibrio you are most familiar with is cholera. The other ones that we care about in the United States and if you eat shellfish are um, uh, Parahemolyticus and Volnificus. Volnificus is the one that causes a wound infection that's highly fatal, um, but the transmission cycle is very similar for all of them. And this is a, a slide, it's rather old actually, of one of Rita Paulo's graduate students, who's now quite accomplished on his own, Constantine Magni, is um, responsible for the slide. And I put it up because I want you to look at the different phases of the ecological system and how the cocoa pods and the vibrio are transmitted through the marine environment. Um, into the human system by exposure from washing, um, from water consumption, contaminated water consumption. Uh, we can predict the risk of vibrios because we know that there's a connection between vibrios and sea surface temperature. This is a slide of the first vibrio outbreak in Alaska in 2004. The sea surface temperatures were higher there than they'd ever been before, and this was the first time they'd ever seen a vibrio outbreak in that part of the world. Um, what we did in NOAA was, this is not to predict color, but it is to predict vibrios because we care about it from a shellfish perspective. We know that sea surface temperature and salinity are drivers for vibrio, so we looked at the different models and are actually putting into operation a vibrio forecast product with our Food and Drug Administration and with our state and local health departments in some parts of the United States, not everywhere. We've got two to three day forecast, 14 day and monthly forecasts of Vibrio risk. This is an example of the Chesapeake Bay. We also give guidance to the Shellfish Sanitation Commission and to the Food and Drug Administration and to the local seafood growers. So we're talking about putting science into action. The shellfish are affected by their coastal environment, by runoff, and the quality of that food affects our health. Um, we're very pleased to have the partnerships we have because as an agency that just does environmental monitoring and prediction, we have to be working with our public health partners to be able to do this. And this has evolved over a very long period of time. That partnership with FDA um, has been probably at least 20 years in the making. Here we go though. We've got projections of long-term risk for Vibrio. We know what the, what the risk is gonna look like in the future. What are we doing about it? What are we doing about it? What are we doing about the risk of increased harmful algal blooms? This is the green water I was talking about. Um, it was an infrastructure failure of our drinking water systems combined with the harmful algal bloom outbreak we weren't anticipating. And we had to close our, our people were drinking bottled water for days in Toledo, three days, I can't remember the cost, but it was huge. So we've also done some operational harmful algal bloom forecasting um, systems. We've had one in the Gulf Coast of um, Florida for several years. We've got a few that are being built in the Northeast and in the Great Lakes, of course, and along the rest of the coast of Florida um, and into the Gulf. We're also working in uh, Puget Sound to operationalize with some of the folks in the public health department in Puget Sound, and that's in Seattle, Washington area, for those of you who don't know DC, um, to take this idea here of an extended seasonal opportunity for these um, harmful algal blooms to grow 
Uh, we're trying to work with the local growers to make sure that they have the information they need, sorry, when they need it because we know that the, the season's gonna start earlier and last longer. And so I was actually trying to give, um, a, a, I put a session together at AMS last year with the shellfish growers and the public-private partnership and I couldn't get the shellfish growers to go because they were so busy out sampling the environment with NOAA on the vessel. I mean, I got one of them to come, but they were actually out taking samples as they recognized the value of that information. Um, so it's just a list of the forecasts that are coming. I'll skip over that. So how do we turn all this into making decisions? How do we know how much certainty is enough? How often do we have to be right? How does a decision maker make the first step and the second step? What happens if they're wrong? What do we get the political will, the institutional support? How do we actually make it happen in a health context? These are all questions we hear about. How, you know, how do I know how to trust that forecast? So I'm switching to the last piece here, and is how do we how have we done this? And in a little bit of re rewriting history here. Not all of these things were done in the context of an integrated information system, but in the course of building these different capacities for operationalizing a Mobrio forecast, for operationalizing a HAB forecast, for looking at with belly fever and FuseNet, we also have another system on draw. We have adopted and found very successful the old notion of integrated information systems, which is a framework that allows us to inform strategic responses to anticipate opportunities for, for early action, um, communicate it to the actors and sustain the engagement needed to build that trust. And in order to do that, you have to do it over a long period of time, which we have learned by default. It has taken a while to get some of these done. Five components to it. Defining demand starts with what does somebody need, who do, who do they need it from, who are they gonna trust, Making sure you've got the problem right. What observations, monitoring, and forecast tools do they need to actually solve that problem? Do they understand it? Are you communicating it well? Are they going to be able to prepare and adapt? And, and how does that actually happen on their side? And in the end, it's supposed to be an integrated information system that both enhances preparedness and enhances resilience. You can't prevent everything, but you can do a better job of preparing. I think Chris might have given me this slide, but I like this. <laughs> if you look at the little uh, things on here, the biggest problem with communication is the illusion that it has taken place. My own theory is that that's why it takes such a long time to do these things. We all think we're on the same page, and I think you're understanding what I'm telling me, what I'm telling you. But I bet each one of you has a slightly different spin on what I actually mean by that. So it would take us a while to figure out and come to the same place. That's okay, we just have to recognize that communication is a skill we all have to work on. As scientists, we have to figure out how to communicate in a different way um, in this day and age. You can't just communicate within your own science community. Um, two examples of integrated information systems, and I'm about done. So when you I earlier talked about what's the nature of the problem, and I talked about drought being one of them. Um, extended droughts or expected extended, you know, more extreme events, drought being one of them. In the U.S., we have a very robust system, and I'm only putting one slide up on it, but it has a website there. It's a national integrated drought information system, and it and um, agriculture businesses and other decision makers that come together on a regular basis to do a drought monitor, a drought forecast, there's a drought portal, and it is the place to go for drought. Now, it has the advantage that it also has a law that established it. It has the political will of the Western governors behind it, not when it started, but it does now. So some of the components that make these things work, political will, institutional support, and a long time of engagement with decision makers, policy makers, and scientists over a long period of time. It does work. Um, why am I talking about temperature? Some of you who know me and know what I've been working on for the last year or so might wonder why I was not talking about heat. Ha, here it is. Because heat affects everything we just talked about. So, you're not disappointed, I hope. Everything we talked about is affected by heat. And I know most of you are working on heat in here in some way, shape, or form, so I'm not going into a big heat talk. We've got sessions, which I'm gonna go listen to. Sound terrific. 
But we all know that we're going to have more heat waves and temperatures are increasing. We also know that we can predict heat and heat related impact, uh, heat related things like humidity and relative humidity and a bunch of stuff. We can or we can but we don't yet on many time scales. In order to be able to manage the heat risk that affects not just urban environments but affects animals and livestock and pests and crops and disease outbreaks and air quality and exacerbates the components of wildfires. You know, we have to, got to figure out how we, how we work together to harness the knowledge that all of you have and that the, the world has worked a lot on heat, but we haven't figured out yet how to pull it all together in a way that decision makers are really using it in a regular way, much further along with heat than anything else. But part of the goal here is to say, all right, we've got, we know, we know we're going to have more heat waves. We know it's not just, I mean, vulnerable populations in the urban environment are still at great risk, but it isn't just them. So how do we actually pull together the network of people working on heat so that we can learn from each other, so that we can get to this time scale issue and begin to plan differently? So the National Integrated Heat Health Information System was started by NOAA and CDC in just before the, we had a workshop in Chicago in 2015, which some of you attended. Um, it was launched officially by the White House, so we had the political buy-in, um, that was the Obama administration. Um, we still have an interagency working group. Um, the point here is that when we started this, it's recognized we're not starting from scratch. It's a way of, of sustaining this engagement so that we can learn from each other. And in order to do that, we created an interagency group so we could have a conversation at the relevant there. We have a series of pilots, partners. Um, student rotation should be in italics. We want to have student rotations. We don't yet. Um, and then the Global Heat Health Information Network. And I'm not really going to go into this too much because you're going to have to go to the talks tomorrow. Hunter Jones, who's in the room, is giving a talk on NIHIS and Jen, and we have the Jen Dialogue, so I'm done talking about heat. <laughs> um, globally, I, I don't know who found this. This slide, this slide is from Joy, but I don't like to look at this. There's no need to consult your local weather map. I made a map for you. <laughs> I'm sure that that still happens somewhere. But globally, we also know that there are huge problems with heat. So the whole idea behind Jen is to take the principles of, of NIAS of sort of, we know people are working, we need to learn from each other, we need to do it in a sustained, systematic way by asking some questions across our networks of each other. Um, so Jen is the, uh, the international piece that's designed to do that, and Glenn already put a very nice plug in for it, so I'll just remind you that um, Joy, who's in the room, sitting next to Hunter, um, and Sarah Giltz um, are also involved in and leading pretty much the gin efforts and some of the NIHIS efforts. So, um, come Tuesday and learn more. Okay. Operational and gin lines about one health. Um, are we there yet? I don't know. I went back to some of my um, old school <laughs> thoughts on paradigm sh shifts, Thomas Kuhn. I actually studied institutional design for a while. Um, a time when the usual and accepted way of doing or thinking about something changes completely. The last one, acceptance by a majority of a change, belief, attitude, or way of doing things. We talk about one health, but have we really incorporated? Are we are we behaving differently? Could we? You know, the whole idea behind chaos theory is there's a chaos in the, the moment that people reorganize you, you actually find your optimal. I feel like we might be in that mix right now. Um, so what is your role? As a scientist, behaving differently, learning how to communicate as a teacher, a student, a mentor, changing your behavior, changing your science, thinking about how you do your science differently, working with people differently, being a member of your community just as a human being. How do you want to behave in this world where we know we have to look at the intersections of how we live with our animals and our ecosystems in different ways to be able to manage it in a sustainable fashion? In our own way, we can each be an agent of change. Are you going to be the scientist that wants to be on the academy board? Are you going to be the one that's out talking to the school kids? Are you going to be the one that's talking to the media, the one that's courting the mayor of the town? Are you going to be the dean of your school or are you going to be the head of your lab? 
you know, what, what do you want your role to be? It can't be just one role anymore, not in this world, not if you're trying to help make a change and make the world a better place. Have to have some other social responsibility, even as just a scientist. So I feel like collectively, in our own way, we can be an agent of change, but collectively, we can make a much bigger impact that helps protect the ecosystems, animals, plants, and ourselves in the process. So, my last slide, in my perfect world, this is an operationalized One Health model. 